Alamo wished her well. She gave me a little gift and said good luck to receive those words before I skated. And, um, you know, she was a big reason why I was even in the sport. With the support of her idol, Christy faced the greatest challenge of her life. Looking back now, it almost seems um, like, wow, yeah, she, it was kind of like she's passing the torch. Just as Dorothy Hamill had 16 years before, Christy won not only Olympic gold, but the hearts of a nation. It's about the dream. I mean, Christy, from when she was a little, little girl, wanted to be an Olympic skater. The future Olympian was born in California's Bay Area on July 12th of 1971 to proud parents Carol, a homemaker, and Jim, a dentist. Her parents named her Christine Tsuya Yamaguchi. All three of us have Japanese middle names. Mine is Tsuya, which was my grandmother's name. My parents gave us American names because my father wanted our family to assimilate. When my children were born, I gave them Japanese middle names because I felt honored to be a Japanese American. And I wanted my children to feel the same, to understand their heritage and appreciate who they are. Christie's ancestors left Japan in the early 1900s with hopes of a better life for their American-born children. But soon after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, Christie's family was ordered into internment camps, along with 110,000 citizens and immigrants of Japanese descent. Ironically, Christie's grandfather, George Doi, proudly fought for his country as a soldier in the United States Army while his family was interned. I was born in Amachi, Colorado, which was one of the relocation camps that the Japanese were um, sent to. World War II brought with it a climate of fear and anti-Japanese sentiment. Christie's mother was too young to remember much from that horrific time, but her father has his own haunting memories. He was five years old when his family was interned. We went to the uh, Santa Clara Fairgrounds, and I remember we spent a few days in the horse stalls there. And then from there, we were uh, transported on trains to uh, Arizona. And I remember the train rides. The war ended in 1945, and after three years behind fences, Christie's family was released. They had lost everything, and the following years were spent struggling to rebuild their lives. My parents really didn't talk too much about it, except to come back and work hard. They finally were able to buy a home and start a new life. I know it was an injustice, but I, it's not something that I like to dwell on because good things have come from being American uh, as long as it doesn't happen again. It was her grandparents' wish that future generations find success in this land of opportunity, and they taught their grandchildren that with hard work and determination, anything is possible. That's something they instilled in, in all three of us is you don't do something halfway. If you're going to do it, you do it 100% and, uh, you know, otherwise you're just, you're wasting your, your time. Christy became familiar with struggle the moment she was born. One of the greatest athletes of our time was born with a birth defect called clubfoot that left her with twisted feet and ankles. For the first two years I had this cast and every two weeks I had to go in, my mom would take me in and they would uh, put new casts on because I was growing and, uh, you know, just try to encourage my legs to grow straight. Even as a baby, Christy was determined. It was amazing. She had two, a, a cast on each leg, a bar in between, still managed to crawl and actually stood up and started to walk when she was about 11 months old. And I just remember my legs aching a lot and sometimes my dad would have to get up in the middle of the night and, and rub my legs because they were aching so much. The doctors encouraged us to exercise her, turn her feet in, out. Um, I thought anything she could do, run, skip, jump rope, would help, help strengthen her feet. So we started her in dance. When the casts came off, dance recitals were Christie's first taste of an audience, but when she saw an amateur ice show at the local mall, nothing else could compare. I loved the costumes and the music and just seeing the skaters out on the ice and seeing how big you know, the surface was and how they filled it um, was enchanting. She was very young, maybe three or four years old, and uh, of 
Of course, she wanted to get on the ice right away, but my wife didn't think that was very good. My parents wanted to wait until she was a little bit older, but it was something that she didn't forget about. In 1976, the nation was mesmerized by a young skater named Dorothy Hamill, who had just won the Olympic gold medal. Christie's fate was sealed. And I don't think at the time I really knew what the Olympics were and, um, you know, how they really changed her life. But at the time, I, like, I wanted to be just like her, do the same things she did. <laughs> She saw Dorothy Hamill skate and was just fell in love with Dorothy Hamill and decided she wanted to to chase you know the goal of becoming the best figure skater she could. When I was six years old, my mom said, "Okay, you're old enough now. Um, if you still want to try skating, I'll take you." That's when it all started. She seemed to be so focused on learning how to skate. She was kind of shy and kind of you know, afraid to go by herself, but once she was on the ice, she just seemed to just love it and take take to it. For some reason, when I stepped out onto the ice, it was like all of a sudden, this is my stage. You know, this is um, where I feel comfortable. But skating didn't come easily to the little girl who was just finding her balance. She would have to work a little extra hard, harder to get her body to do what she wanted it to do. Just as she was taught, Christy gave it her all and began to see results. She entered her first competition at age seven, and by age nine, when there were no signs of her childhood impairment, Christy began training with the coach who would take her all the way to Olympic gold. I didn't find that there was anything really holding Christy back. I mean, she had a little problem with turnout. That was probably it. There was, you never saw any signs that there were any problems from her childhood. It wasn't long before visions of representing her country just like Dorothy Hamill inspired Christy, and other skaters began to take notice. I actually competed against her. I was a figure skater myself for a very short time in my life, but you always knew if you were going to skate against Christy, you weren't ever going to win. She had nothing but talent and skill and work ethic, and you didn't have to tell her to get on the ice. She was there before you could even go, well, and she's on the ice. The discipline carried over outside the rink. Determined to succeed despite all obstacles, the little girl made great sacrifices to pursue her dream. It's not just the on the ice training, it's really the discipline off the ice and the, the weightlifting and the diet. She'd be in bed by 7.30, 8 o'clock, and uh, she'd be up by 3.45, 4 a.m. and on the ice by 5 a.m. I was skating every day before school and a lot of times, you know, learned how to do homework in the car, get changed in the car, eat breakfast and lunch in the car. <laughs> At least three times a week going back to the rink after school. You knew that uh, she was gearing up and getting really serious about what she wanted to do. Coming up next, two devastating deaths put Christie's Olympic dreams in jeopardy. It was probably the first time that someone so close in my life had, had uh, left. And later, Christy falls in love with another Olympian. His pickup line was, well, if you ever want to come to any of the games, I'll get you some tickets. Yeah, I mean, how many other people does he say this to? When Lifetime's Intimate Portrait returns. We now return to Lifetime's Intimate Portrait of Christy Yamaguchi. When Olympic champion Christy Yamaguchi takes the ice, there are no signs of the foot deformity that plagued her at birth. With the determination of her parents and grandparents, who had endured years in internment camps during World War II, Christy was focused on success. Her dream was to skate in the Olympics, and she spent her childhood making that dream become a reality. You're hoping that someday that maybe everything will uh, work out for you and you know people will know who you are and watch for you and think that, well, maybe someday she'll be something. <laughs> At age 11, Christy caught the eye of a young skater looking for a partner. I went up to my coach, Jim Hulick, and I said, you know, I really want to skate pairs, give it a try. And they all just started laughing. They're like, how are we going to find a, a skater shorter than you? and a good skater at that. I just said, what about her? And I pointed to Christy. Uh, Jim Hulick, Rudy's coach, kind of put us together and let us try out and, you know, let's see you skate together. And we tried to hold hands and skate. And of course, you're not that age, you're just like, ooh, okay. <laughs> 
After years of single skating, Christy was no longer alone on the ice. Being a pair team is almost like a marriage. I mean, you work together. Uh, if there is a mishap, it's both your fault. It's not one or the other. You um, have this bond between each other. It's like brother and sister. And the love there is just like, okay, you don't have to be nervous. Isolated from schoolmates because of her training schedule, Christy shared a special bond with Rudy. Christy and Rudy spent a lot of time together, not only on the ice, but off the ice. It was like uh, when they were both young, kind of growing up together. I spent about a good five years living at their house. We became basically brother and sister, and I became part of their family. Just three years after their pairing, Jim Hewlett coached the duo to a breakthrough competition at the 1988 World Junior Championships. Although Rudy put his singles career on hold to concentrate on their pairing, Christy was successfully juggling both events, and Christy delighted her personal coach with her singles performance at the same competition. And she won the ladies' event, and she turned around the next day and won the pairs. And I just saw a look come over her face of determination and, and really wanting to do it. I think that was the first time um, on a world level, even though it was the Junior Worlds, where people kind of took notice and it was like, wow, okay, so these are skaters to take seriously. The annual U.S. Nationals are one of the Olympic qualifying events for American skaters, and in 1989, Christy placed second in singles and won the pairs title with Rudy. But just as she began to climb the amateur ranks, her singles coach of eight years fell in love and moved away, leaving Christy behind. So I moved from the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, up to Stony Plain, Alberta, Canada, when I got married. Christy wanted to follow her. She did not want to change coaches. She trusted her and depended on her. Christy would not let distance stand in the way of her dreams. At the time I was 17, I had just graduated from high school. Literally the day after graduation, I left for Canada. And Christy Ness's husband, Andrew, had a new wife and a new teenage daughter <laughs> moving in with him. The move had a huge impact on Christy and Rudy's six-year pairing. Christy would travel up there for like three weeks and work on singles, and then those three weeks we wouldn't do anything, and then it became time for me to um, travel to Canada just for like a week, just to train in pairs, and it was kind of affecting our skating. Then, in a crushing blow, the man who trained Christy and Rudy told them he was dying of cancer. Jim taught us everything from the time uh, that we, we first stepped on the ice together. It was tough, obviously, on both Rudy and myself. Jim Hewlett lost his battle with cancer on December 10th of 1989, and compounding her grief, Christie's beloved grandfather died just five days later. It was very, very difficult because those are people that you depend on, the people that you that you need in your life. It was hard for us to really get through it. I, I actually, you know, our relationship was was changed after that. With their partnership in danger after the loss of their coach, Christy and Rudy managed to reclaim their title at the 1990 Nationals. But although Christy was touted as the singles favorite, she plays second for the second year in a row. Second place in Nationals is not a bad place to be, but it's not a great place to be when you want to be an Olympic gold medalist. The pressure on the 18-year-old was becoming unmanageable. And at the 1990 Worlds, Christy finished fourth in singles and fifth in pairs with Rudy. Her Olympic dreams were slipping away. I didn't skate well in either event. And um, actually, um, an International Skating Union official approached me after the competition and um, kind of told me, you know what, I think it's time to make a choice. I think she realized that as a pair team, they, they could be fourth in the world, but as a single skater, she could be Olympic champion. The end came on April 26th of 1990, when Christy, Carol, and a mediator from the U.S. Figure Skating Association met with Rudy to discuss the painful dissolution of their partnership. I think he knew we were growing apart and things weren't working out that well. Um, and maybe sensed it, but I think it was still a shock. I remember just Christy crying and everyone crying, and I, I really didn't cry till I got into the car. And I was angry at first. It was a pretty devastating time for uh, me and for Rudy, especially. We spent day in, day out together, working on the ice together, and I considered it a marriage. 
And I think definitely, even that day that we split up, it was, for me, felt like a divorce. And it was just so devastating. You know, seven years that we, our lives were, were intertwined. And, and, you know, when you cut the cord like that, it's just kind of like, well, now what? Coming up next, Christy starts over and goes for the gold. Even though you've practiced hours and hours and hours, it comes down to those um, few minutes out on the ice. And later, ghosts from the past threaten Christy's success. There was, at the time, a lot of um, anti-Japanese sentiment that had kind of come up again. Lifetime's Intimate Portrait returns after this. Lifetime. You're watching Lifetime's Intimate Portrait of Christy Yamaguchi. Christy Yamaguchi's childhood was spent aiming for Olympic gold. By age 19, she had evolved into an accomplished skater. She had endured the deaths of her grandfather and one of her coaches. And after a long partnership with skater Rudy Galindo, Christy made the difficult decision to leave him, hoping to improve her own chances as a single skater with the Olympic Games of her dreams only two years away. It made it a lot easier just to compete and be concentrating on one thing. And, um, yeah, we saw, obviously, results the next year. 91 was uh, the World Championships in Munich and um, won my first world title there. New sophisticated choreography and glamorous costumes helped Christy win the 91 Worlds and finally capture the elusive national title in January of 1992. Christy's focus on her solo skating had paid off. After dreaming of this moment for years, Christy was named, along with Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding, to the team that would represent the U.S. at the Olympics. That's always been my goal, so if my career ends after that, then I'd be happy. The Olympic countdown had begun, and the press compared Christy to her biggest competitor, Midori Ito from Japan. Christy and Midori Ito. I mean, the competition was just between those two. The push behind Midori Ito was that she could do a triple axel. Only Midori Ito, and a then relatively unknown skater named Tanya Harding, had mastered the dreaded triple axel jump. And the press pitted these athletes against the artistry of Christy and her friend Nancy Kerrigan. I think just the fact that I didn't have the triple axel was the talk the whole year. You know, are you going to do it? Are you working on it? Are you doing it? Are you landing it? Is it in the program? It's like, no, 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 no. Her strength was that she was an entire package. And Christy, just because she didn't do a triple axel, didn't mean that she was technically inferior. So I had the triple let's triple toe combination, which, uh, you know, we tried to get the word out there, hey, this is just as hard as a triple axel. <laughs> Christy left for the 1992 Winter Olympics without that one jump that eluded her and without any thoughts of meddling. I don't think she had any expectations going into it. I know that she had gotten advice from quite a few friends and people surrounding her just saying, you know, enjoy the experience. I talked to Scott Hamilton and he told me, have Christy go early, being her first Olympics, go early, enjoy opening ceremonies, meet as many athletes, as you can, as you can, enjoy every moment. And that's exactly what Christy did, rooming with rival and friend Nancy Kerrigan in the Olympic Village and participating in the opening ceremonies. Oh, everyone has worked their whole lives. Uh, we've come together in an incredible event that takes place only every four years, so it's a special thing to just be there. I had my camera with me and I took pictures with a lot of the other athletes and met, you know, other athletes from the U.S. team, skiers and bobsledders, uh, the hockey team. Christy was particularly interested in the hockey games. A mishmash of us all went to see the U.S. hockey um, bronze medal game. They had made it to the bronze medal game and went to cheer them on hoping they would win a medal. And they were the loudest, I think, the loud, loudest Americans in the building that night. And uh, unfortunately, we, we didn't win the bronze medal game, but afterwards had an opportunity to meet these athletes. And, and obviously, one of the athletes was Christy. Christy left a lasting impression on Brett. But despite the festivities, she knew she had a job to do and dreams to realize. And not even the media's interest in her story would stand in her way. I was a coach at the um, 1988 Winter Games in Calgary and I watched the U.S. skaters get pulled 
so many different directions, and I wasn't going to let that happen to Christy. Christy was well prepared. She had hired an agent to keep the press at bay and allow her to focus on skating. They have this one goal and they need to focus on it. And um, when you have all these distractions coming in, we like to protect them from the outside. Christy and her coach left the excitement of Albertville behind to train in seclusion for three days. She returned refreshed and focused on her goal. The first night of the competition was the short program and it's a really intense night of competition. The short program was the Blue Danube and it was a waltz and just kind of a dreamy number. Christy skated a flawless program without the triple axle and ended the night in first place. Two days later, just before her final skate, Dorothy Hamill stopped by to offer words of encouragement. She gave me a little gift and said good luck. Um, it was a thrill because I had maybe met her once or twice before. Um, but uh, to receive those words before I skated and, um, you know, she was a big reason why I was even in the sport. With her idol's good wishes ringing in her ears, Christy took to the ice for her long program, Malaguena, a sophisticated Spanish piece. It is you alone out there. You can only skate as well as you can and then be satisfied with that because the ultimate result is in the hands of the judges. Even though you've practiced hours and hours and hours, it comes down to those few minutes out on the ice. It goes by so fast, you don't want it to end. Christy had done all she could. Now it was time to wait for the results. So I had to watch uh, the five other girls compete after me and sit and wonder if my marks are, and if my skating was going to be good enough. She had been better than good. The triple axle jumpers had faltered, and Christy became the first American woman to win Olympic gold since Dorothy Hamill had back in 1976. She shared the awards podium with silver medalist Midori Ito and bronze medalist Nancy Kerrigan. Probably never have felt anything like that, standing on the podium and hearing the national anthem, seeing the American flag go up, knowing that that moment was kind of been a culmination of this whole thing, of your dreams. Christy became the first Asian American to win an Olympic medal in figure skating. And there was great irony in her patriotic victory. February marked the 50th anniversary of the presidential order to incarcerate any West Coast resident of Japanese ancestry. Her family watched proudly from the stands as Christy made history. I was so happy for her and yet I was so sad because my father wasn't there to see this. And it was something that he was so proud that this is kind of a culmination of a dream that they had. That maybe someday one of our children in the future generations would be recognized or would be honored by, by our country. Now that Christy had realized her grandparents' dreams as well as her own, a whole new future lay ahead. When you achieve a goal like Christy did at 20 years old, it, it's a little frightening because you're so young. Well, I'm 20 years old and what, you know, what better thing can happen than this? Is this it? Next on Lifetime's Intimate Portrait, Christy becomes a star. I'm going to tell you, your life now is completely different. And later, she discovers there's more to life than skating. Never thought that being a five foot one figure skater I can be a fashion model. Lifetime's Intimate Portrait will return. This is Lifetime's Intimate Portrait of Christy Yamaguchi. With Christy Yamaguchi's 1992 Olympic gold medal, the 20-year-old had not only lived every athlete's dream, but realized her own childhood fantasies and achieved the sought-after success of generations of immigrants. There was much to celebrate. She returned to the Bay Area a hometown hero. All of a sudden you have the persona of Olympic champion, and um, at first it's a little intimidating because you think, well, what does that mean? What do I have to do? Her world had changed. You know, and all she did was get on two planes, one there and one back, and your whole world is different. Despite her newfound celebrity, there was still something Christy wanted to accomplish. 
Right after the Olympics, um, about three and a half, four weeks later, was the World Championships. And they were being held in Oakland, California, which is you know the backyard of my hometown. So um, there's no question that I was going to go there and defend my title. Christy became world champion for the second year in a row, achieving yet another goal. With this win, she earned figure skating's triple crown, winning the nationals, the Olympics, and the worlds all in one season. Now it was time to live up to her reputation. Christy's dreams came with a price she hadn't bargained for. You just feel like, all right, my life's on display. I got to do all the right things. I got to be perfect. I got to, you know, make all the right decisions. The Olympic gold medal is is the most coveted prize in figure skating, and um, there are so many um, there's so many consequences to getting the title. People expect you to be an Olympic champ in your performances, in the way you act. Um, you know whether or not you want to be a role model. Hopefully, uh, some of the values and and things that I've learned um, will be a good example for the kids out there. She graciously accepted the responsibility of being a role model, not only for children around the world, but also for the Asian community. As the first Olympic figure skating champion of Asian descent, her win meant so much to so many. You'd be surprised how many grandmothers had come up to her, so excited and proud that she made the ultimate dream come true for them too. I think she probably represents, whether you're Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Vietnamese, um, a person of Asian descent accomplishing the American dream. Oh, I think it was almost fitting that the Sports Illustrated cover said American Dream and kind of emphasized that, that, hey, this is an all-American girl. For some communities, it was a challenge um, to really understand that she's American first and foremost. But overall, I think it was wonderful. I think it moved us all forward in understanding that American is really a whole lot of things. Sadly, the same tragic event that had changed the lives of her grandparents came back to haunt the Olympic champion 50 years later. It was the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, so there was at the time a lot of um, anti-Japanese sentiment that had kind of come up again. And the press was quick to assume racism when the highly anticipated deals with advertisers seemed slow in coming. I started noticing that the media was kind of questioning um, is Chrissy Amaguchi marketable? Will she get endorsements? I think there was the illusion that nothing was coming. Um, started to think of the story, oh, well, it's because she's Asian. But, you know, I never felt that way. My family never felt that way. It was disturbing just because I knew that she had the endorsement offers. And we had turned down some initially because they either weren't the right companies or they weren't quite right in the fit. Ultimately, the controversy subsided and the endorsement deals flew fast and furious. Advertisers welcomed any association with Christie's wholesome image and hired her to sell such products as contact lenses, food, restaurants, milk, and most prestigiously for an athlete, cereal, including Wheaties, the breakfast of champions. With a strong appreciation for the feel and comfort of the material of her glamorous skating costumes, one of Christie's favorite roles has been as spokeswoman for the fabric acetate, which threw her into the exciting world of high fashion. We worked with a lot of different designers uh, who used acetate. <laughs> Can you believe that's you? No, it doesn't look like me. Well, maybe it does. I never thought that being a Five foot one figure skater I can be a fashion model. The opportunities seemed limitless. You have had this, such a focus your whole life and all of a sudden the door opens up and there's a whole world out there. You get to make all the decisions. I think I just tried to surround myself with some good people and get some good advice. And luckily, Christy had friends she could turn to. Her Olympic gold medal sits beside Brian and Scott's in the U.S. Figure Skating Museum. When it came time to trade amateur competitions for professional performances, she looked to Scott, who was heading the Stars on Ice tour. And Christy always wanted to be in an ice show, in a, in a great ice show. And what we had to offer that the other shows didn't was a real solid platform to create um, the next level of ability, um, artistry. I think this goes all the way back 
to the first time Christy saw an ice show when she was only four. Now comes the beautiful costumes, the lights, and the makeup. She's just looked forward to this professional career touring with Stars on Ice. Christy spent a year having the time of her life with the world-class skaters of Stars on Ice. And although she had the opportunity to return to the 1994 Olympics, she knew it would never compare to her 1992 experience and decided to stay with the tour. The Lillehammer Olympics became notorious for the Tanya Harding-Nancy Kerrigan scandal, while Christy Yamaguchi became a professional skating sensation. I knew that I was doing something I loved and um, it was kind of a graduation of what I had left behind. Now there were no judges, only appreciative audiences, and Christy found a new joy in skating. I think the audience gives me the inspiration to skate. I want to give them a gift, and my gift of skating, and um, a performance that uh, they'll remember. Coming up next, an old relationship is repaired. I think time heals all. As a new one begins. When Lifetime's Intimate Portrait continues. Lifetime. This is Lifetime's Intimate Portrait of Christy Yamaguchi. After achieving all of her dreams by winning Olympic gold, Christy Yamaguchi became an instant celebrity and a role model to millions of children. She passed on the opportunity to return to Olympic competition in order to continue doing what she loved, traveling the world with a Stars on Ice tour. In 1995, Christy landed in Vancouver, Canada, where a hunky hockey player from the 1992 Olympic team was participating in the opening ceremonies for his team's new arena. And you have some kind of bond when you've met somebody at an Olympic Games representing your country with you. That's kind of what made me go up and reintroduce myself three years later in 95 in Vancouver. Brett seemed a nice enough guy, and he shared Christy's passion for the ice, but there were some childhood rivalries to be ironed out. There always seemed to be a rivalry between the hockey players and figure skaters. We always had a great ice time at 1 o'clock. Oh, those hockey players are taking our ice time away from us. And they're usually banged up in the face and so forth. They change in the lobby and in front of all the figure skaters. Yeah, we don't smell very good. They would kind of be banging their sticks on the boards, you know, trying to get us off the ice. They're always, you know, putting holes and jumping on our ice and, and making our ice not as good as we, we'd like it. So I think there was a two-way street there. We're just different breeds. There's hockey players and then there's figure skaters. And Brett's height of six foot two to Christie's five foot one topped the list of differences, but obviously it was meant to be. He broke my stereotype that I had for a hockey player. He's definitely worth getting to know a little better. Christie's family and friends approved. Well, I thought it was rather ironic that she would be uh be talking about a hockey player when, you know, every, all along they would mm, turn their noses up ho uh, as far as hockey players because they were always so uncouth. He's just such a nice, you know, very down-to-earth Midwestern guy. I mean, you look at him, here's Brett. He's this giant guy and he's strong as an ox and he treats her almost like this flower that's about to, like, fall apart. Their long-distance relationship blossomed, despite the demands put on the two professional athletes. Christy had become quite a busy woman off the ice. And it's always been her dream to help other children that have not had the advantages that she's had. Maybe uh, children that don't have a strong family unit or are physically challenged. One of the first ways we started was to do an event called Skates in the Park that was done in partnership with United Way. She really enjoyed the outcome. And after that event is when she said, you know, I'd really like to set up my own foundation. And it was only appropriate that when she decided to set up her charitable foundation that it be called the Always Dream Foundation. This was her motto, always dream, keep dreaming, keep focused, you know, stay on that straight line. And I think we too, the foundation, live by that motto. We're very small, no full-time staff, but we're able to come up with great ideas to really help impact children. With renewed purpose, Christy turned her sights to other worthy causes, like the fight against breast cancer. Her personal struggle with breast cancer is a story filled with strength and encouragement. Please welcome my very dear friend, Ms. Peggy Fleming.
She produced two fundraisers that starred Peggy Fleming and other celebrity skaters like Tara Lipinski, Rosalind Sumners, and Katerina Witt. She co-authored two books, Figure Skating for Dummies, and her autobiography, Always Dream. 1998 began with her induction into the U.S. Figure Skating Hall of Fame and ended with rare quality time with her boyfriend of three years. The only thing I wanted for Christmas was uh, was just a dinner for two, obviously, because sometimes our years get, you know, hectic. And I said, that's all I want, is just you and I to have dinner together. At Christmas Eve dinner, Brett proposed. The couple, who spent their lives on the ice, made plans to marry in Hawaii. And the girl who so loved pretty costumes spent hours with designer Vera Wang creating the perfect wedding dress. We were creating you know, a dream dress, something that um, I think every little girl dreams of. <laughs> On July 8th of 2000, family, friends, and the elite skaters of the world gathered for a week-long celebration in Hawaii. It was a dream wedding. There's not one thing that I probably would have changed. We took a proper honeymoon <laughs> right after the wedding because both of us knew this would be the only time, our only opportunity to get away by the time September came around, we were both um, kind of on the road again. Until just recently, Brett spent his time on the road with the Florida Panthers. It helps that the couple has a healthy appreciation for what the other does for a living. For her to step on the ice and to be so elegant and to be so graceful, but yet be athletic as well and be able to do the things that she does. And the consistency at what she, at, at what she does it so I think says a lot about her work ethic. I certainly get a little on edge when it starts to get a little rough out there. I, you know, if something breaks out, I'm looking, is number four out there? Is he out there? But on the whole, um, you know, I, I'm pretty confident about what he does and know that for the most part, he can take care of himself. With Christie's new relationship in full swing, she began to repair one from her past. After a triumphant return to solo skating, Rudy Galindo became a national champion back in 1996, and Christy called to congratulate him. And she said um, to me how proud she was of me and how exciting it was, and, and I remember her saying that my life will never be the same. I was happy that he went and started skating singles again, and then, um, you know, he had his own success at the U.S. Nationals and then getting a world medal um, a few years later. Though no longer partners, the two frequently share the same ice as professional skaters. I know people are saying, wow, look at Christy and Rudy are on the same ice together. And they're, they're still pursuing their dreams. And I think it's just built up our friendship too, being on that same ice. It's like a, a glue that keeps us together. Unfortunately, the ice that bonds Christy and Rudy is the same ice that separates her from her husband. People say absence makes the heart grow fonder, but um, I'm wondering if that person ever had a long distance relationship because it's tough. This is kind of a, a unique year because it's her last year um, on the tour, um, Stars and Ice, and uh, we're, we're both looking forward to it as her last year. I think she's, she's looking forward to moving on. I'm thankful and I know that I've had a great career in skating, but um, after getting married, it just, it wasn't, the most important thing in my life anymore. It, it is a strange thing because I lived it, I depended on it, I am in control of it, and now I have this other person and it's great to have that feeling knowing that you can move on and, and see something else in life that's worth trying. <laughs> Skating will always be with her, always be in her, and I think that she'll always want to skate in some way, shape, or form, share that with her family, hockey player, husband, figure skating mother. Yeah, I think that their uh, kids are going to have a future in the ice. Ten years after Christie's Olympic victory, she is as popular as ever. She has been named a Goodwill Ambassador for the 2002 Winter Games in Salt Lake City, Utah. In a year when the American spirit is more alive than ever, people can look at Christie's achievements and keep her as a symbol of the hopes and dreams of a nation determined to succeed. I don't know if people truly understand the amount of dedication, the amount of time, and the amount of discipline it takes to reach the level that she reached and to accomplish what she did. And she is an American dream from that standpoint that she sought out a dream and she fulfilled it. As a child, Christy dreamed of being Dorothy Hamill. Now, little girls around the world want to be Christy Yamaguchi.
My philosophy is um, to dream big. You know, have a dream out there. Don't be afraid to dream. Know that there are going to be obstacles along the way, some ups and some downs, but learn from them. I think the most important thing is to believe in yourself. You know, if you keep believing and you keep a positive attitude and you work hard, it's, it's all possible. So many people see success as an endpoint. What Christy Yamaguchi shows us is that it's really an opportunity to give back. I'm just glad that she doesn't make skating outfits in my size or they'd be coming to get me as I gracefully slide across my living room floor. For Intimate Portrait, I'm Meredith Vieira. On Lifetime, your client is on trial for murder. The one witness to the crime. You have to put me on the stand. Your husband. I saw him rape her. Oh, you're pathetic. Would you expose the truth? Why have you decided to come forward now? If it threatened to tear your marriage apart. It only happened once. It was a mistake. I don't want to hear about your midlife crisis. Celia Ward, Bruce Boxleitner, Rachel Ward, Double Jeopardy. A Lifetime movie premiere at 9 tonight.